<laughs> if you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, what is the most eerie thing that's ever happened to you? My ex and I lived in a remote part of northern Nevada. The house was literally in the middle of a field and our neighbors were far away. He worked nights and I never liked how dark and quiet it was. On a night he was working, I fell asleep and had a dream about him. In the dream, he was standing on the edge of a cliff, like the Grand Canyon, looking out at the view. I tried many times to get his attention but he wouldn't acknowledge me. He was just staring straight ahead. After ignoring me for a while, he abruptly turned to me and grabbed the outside of my arms firmly. His face looked panicked and he said, name, there's somebody in the house. Like the movies, my eyes shot open and I woke up with my blood running cold. I lay in bed silently, listening for any sound. I was even more terrified when the dog woke up almost immediately, started barking, and ran out his dog door, into the yard. What did he hear? I never saw or heard anything out of place. I couldn't see anything outside in the dark. The dog came back in and fell asleep. I stayed up the rest of the night, totally creeped out. Years ago, I worked the late shift at a hospital, 4 p.m. midnight. My nightly drive home led me through back roads of fields and woods which often had low-hanging fog, particularly in early spring. I lived in a small town that has a lot of Civil War history. Ghost stories were so popular that area historians would do moonlight ghost walks where they searched for signs of restless spirits roaming the battlefield. The urban legend was that, in a war that pitted brother against brother, those soldiers who were killed by family became souls that were never at rest. I never bought into it, but one night under particularly dense fog did scare the ever-living crap out of me. At around 1 a.m., as I sped through curves and hills, I saw the outline of two figures walking along the side of the road. The closer I got, the more I slowed down as I didn't want to hit them or anything. By the time I passed them, I was going probably 10 miles per hour. First I noticed their weirdly shaped hats. Then, the buttons on their jackets glimmered in my headlights. I swear to God, there were two Civil War soldiers walking in the fog in the moonlight. I could not breathe. The taller one, thin and gangly, looked up at my car and put his hand towards me. I hit the gas so hard. My transmission could barely keep up. I sped off into the night and, when I finally caught my breath, screamed several expletives. As I rounded another curve, I saw a small car, a Geo Metro, pulled over with lights flashing. Its hood was up and steam was coming from the engine. A man in Civil War garb stood close by staring at it with his hands on his hips. Damn reenactors were in town for some event and had car problems. To this day I have no clue why they were out so late. About scared me to death. My bed was in a corner of my room. My closet was in the opposite corner. No door on the closet, and it was stacked with a ton of junk, community storage for the household as I never used it. I wake up lying on my back, with the door in line of sight. I can see that it's full. But I can also see a hand slide out and grip the door frame. Pale and feminine. Followed by the slowly emerging frame of a very tall woman clad in a white, Victorian era dress. She was almost pretty, aside from something in her face that wasn't quite right. I couldn't tell you what it was, but I remember being uneasy about it. For a while, probably about 15 minutes, she just stood there, talking to herself. I wasn't able to make out anything she said, but that's when the panic set in. I realized I couldn't move or speak, couldn't look away, and had no idea what was happening, as I felt fully awake. Then she stopped, looked me in the eye and smiled, and the corners of her mouth pulled back to her ears. Terrifying. She started to approach, and slowly opened her mouth so wide, her chin was touching where I'd estimate the bottom of her ribcage sat. It wasn't long before I could smell her rotten breath, and she began to crawl on top of me. The entire time, she was letting out this awful, multi-tone moan that sounded like five voices at once, all distorted. I could feel her weight resting on my chest. I couldn't breathe or scream as she inched closer. She put my entire head in her mouth, and I fully woke up when all I could see was darkness. I still get a bit panicky remembering that one. It felt so real. Don't know why I decided to share this, but I overcame this fear not long ago. I used to be petrified of the dark. So afraid that I would not sleep alone, even at 16 years of age. When I eventually got my own room, I kept the lights on, hugged a pillow and cornered myself in the bed with the blanket covering most of me. Sometimes this fear would even creep in during the daytime, when for example I was at the big warehouse turned shopping center and suddenly got alone my heart would start racing. The hugeness of the empty room scared me. That all changed when I got my camera and, funnily enough, stayed out full night, all alone, miles from home, to do astrophotography. 
I had been watching some videos, and when I got my camera, all I could think of was sitting alone beneath the vast, open, and infinitely large sky, watching the cosmos above. When the next day it was time to sleep, I did not feel fear. Somehow, the knowledge, that in the grand scheme of the universe, a puny little ghost, if they even do exist could do nothing. My fear of the dark and loneliness went away when I experienced how spectacular it can be. I like to think that, if there was really a demon that night, it must have been sitting beside me pondering over the insignificance and fragility of life on earth, just as I was. I went to Tajikistan in 2019 to meet my new colleagues and learn the area I was to be working in. I was greeted by my employer and a few of my new colleagues at the airport and they took me to an apartment complex where everyone was housed. Every building was dull and dusty on the outside. Upon entering I could see hallways with tile flooring and metal staircases leading to each apartment. The apartments had heavy metal doors. I couldn't decide if I felt safe because everything looked secure, or uneasy. Because why did everything need to be so secure? We walked up to the third floor and entered the door on that landing. As I walked in I was shocked. The floor was covered in immaculately detailed rugs, beautiful wallpaper covered in sparkling gold, plum and emerald colored designs, massive crystal chandeliers and beautiful antique furniture. It felt like I had just walked into an underground palace. There were two women that took my things, showed me to my room and offered me tea, cake and a variety of snacks. Everyone was so kind and welcoming. It was around 6 pm and the women had prepared dinner for everyone. I was the only female in the group of colleagues. We were ushered into the dining room that had a long table close to the floor and surrounded by big beautiful floor pillows. We ate, laughed and had good conversation. Come bedtime one of the ladies brought towels and toiletries to my room and let me get settled in. She told me to lock my door, which I would have done regardless. The doors to the rooms were also a heavy metal door with large sliding locks on them. After I freshened up I got into my pajamas and got into bed to call my husband. We talked for about an hour before I started falling asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night with my phone in my hand. I could hear someone singing. I didn't understand the words but it sounded sad. Made my hair stand up on end. It sounded far away. I got out of bed to look out the window. In the distance was a mountain range with faint lighting behind it as if the moon was setting behind it. The singing was coming from the mountains. It was both beautiful and eerily terrifying. I lost track of time, not even sure how long I was standing at the window. I asked about it the next morning at breakfast and everyone just kind of looked at each other. Never gave me an explanation. They just said some things here are ancient. I'll never forget that experience. I have quite a few but one of the ones from my childhood was a night, I had to be 12 to 15, and was home alone. I was playing on the computer in our den and directly across from it was the door that went up to the pantry which had a set of stairs that led to the attic. Suddenly I heard a loud thump then the repeated thumps as something fell down the stairs. My heart stopped because there was a door at the top of the stairs that shouldn't have allowed anything to do so. I remember getting up and walking over to the door but being unable to touch the knob. Then the sound of pacing started above me. Slowly walking backwards I returned to the den and curled up in a ball on the couch staring at that door as the sound of a thump followed by the sound of something following down the stairs happened again. This continued on for hours till shortly before my parents got home it stopped and never happened again. My dad went up after they got home and confirmed nothing was moved or anything but I hated being alone so night after this. This was the same house I wouldn't shower if nobody was home either though. It was just a bit odd. The one we moved into after this one was worse though. A group of five girls, about 12 years old staying at a friend's for a sleepover in 1995. Friend lives in a rural area, closest neighbor is about a half mile away. The dad built a fort out of an old ship that's in the backyard not far from the house. The cabin of the ship was not the original cabin, but was roughly a 10 times 10 basic wood shack, 2 times 6 planks of wood, with a tin roof, about 4 feet tall inside, could only sit. It was a top 4 8 inch pillars about 5 to 6 feet off the ground. Two doors that swung freely sat opposite from each other, one attached to a plank from the rest of the ship, the other open to a pole that you could slide down to exit. Last, there was a one-foot gap in the wood all around the perimeter between the walls and roof serving as something of a window. We were in there maybe around 9 pm telling ghost stories. You know, holding the flashlight to our faces and laughing. The dad and his friend came out to scare us once, and again to tell us to quiet down. We were having a blast. Then. In the middle of one of our stories we felt what could have been a hammer, or something big and heavy, hit the bottom of the cabin. Shocked, we all laughed it off. Thought it was her dad and his friend messing with us again. Then, something landed on the tin roof. I don't know what anyone else was thinking, 
but they had peacocks as pets which are known to jump on the roofs of houses, so I immediately thought it was one of the birds. Then, the whole cabin started shaking. Not violently, but enough for us to wiggle. Rapidly, the hard objects started hitting the sides in random places and would scrape along the length of the walls, like someone scraping a hammer along a fence. Unexpectedly, door that opened to the pole exit was hit hard and flew open. There was nothing behind it. After a few seconds of silence, all of the things started happening at the same time. Thuds coming from the roof, banging and scraping the walls, the shaking has now become violent and the one door kept being hit open. Candy, the strongest and bravest girl of the group, she won the school's arm wrestling contest, against all the boys, jumped in front of the door to keep it from being hit open. Well, that door was being hit so hard that Candy, while putting all of her weight and effort on it, was being pushed forward. The door was no longer flying open, but was still opening 3 to 4 inches. I will never forget the sheer terror on her face. Needless to say, we were screaming our heads off. Well, one girl was, that's for sure. While all of this was happening I had enough courage to try and look through the window by getting up on my knees. Unfortunately, I couldn't see anything without sticking my head out, and that wasn't gonna happen. I was determined to figure out what was out there so I was intently listening for some kind of human indicator, i.e. laugh, voice, breath, footsteps, etc., and heard nothing. Then, we heard a gunshot from a short distance away. Everything stopped abruptly. It was the dad. He pulled us all out of the cabin and locked us in their giant pantry. After the property was searched we were let out. They found nothing. We were to wait until morning to see the damage. Next morning comes and we head outside with the dad and and his friend. We all piled back into the cabin so the two men could recreate the shaking. It didn't work. They could barely move it. I walked around the outside checking the planks and saw scratches, but nothing else. The last thing that was found was half of an amethyst geode. That's it. The door that was being hit open had no marks on it whatsoever. I only wish I had more of an opportunity to investigate a little more as we were escorted back inside. I only stayed friends with the one screaming girl and I'm glad we, as adults, can still agree on what happened that night. I wish I could find the other girls, Candy, Joy, and Sarah, to hear what they remember. My story starts in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I grew up in this state, New Mexico. This place has always had more than its fair share of spooky stuff, from Roswell to Rout. 666, name now changed, it wouldn't be hard to find someone who had an encounter of sorts. So growing up I lived with my mother and my babysitter, in a place called the South Valley, the reasons for this and the subsequent events that followed are another horror story unto itself, the babysitter had her two adult kids, and three grandkids there too. One of them was named Dustin, now this guy was a metal head in all senses of the word. We're talking 80s Iron Maiden, Metallica, all the big names are fresh to the scene, bullying and fights for being a metal head was an everyday occurrence for this dude, may seem unimportant but this dude wasn't scared of shit, I was 10 or 11 at the time. We'd go out get food from the local fast food joints nearby regularly, our road went right over an old mud arroyo, ditch, you could continue straight or walk along the dirt path beside the arroyo. This path would lead to the backside of a Burger King and besides the landlord's house, unless we really wanted BK, we'd avoid this route for two reasons. One, because the landlord was always watching out his window and two, do there being a small irrigation bridge for the family down the road. You could walk on the bridge if you needed to, it was just a foot in front of foot while holding the one rail at a kind of walk. Slip and you'll go in. One night we wanted BK, so we went, it's about 9 colon 40 ish pm. He wanted to go at closing because they'd hook us up with more food. With him being my senior by 7 years, I figured he knew what was best. We got our food, 2 bags each and decided to go back via the bridge path since it was shorter. Now in the valley we'd get blue moons, a full moon that made the whole place look blue, that night was one. Dustin crossed first, then me, he was about 5 feet ahead of me, we heard something splash and he turned to look if it was me. I see him go white, full-fledged panic mode, all he says is run. Then he drops the food and bolts, the SV was known to be a rough area, I figured he'd seen someone behind me that was gonna mug us or something. I hurry, my foot slips in the water, regain myself and get on the dirt path running to catch him. I'm about where he was initially when I turn back to look, all I can see is a bright white light on the bridge, now I know it ain't no bicycle, nor can it be someone with a flashlight, too steady and fast. My turn to drop food and run like hell. I catch up to Dustin and we get inside the house. I dive on the couch in the living room and he goes to his room. About 10 minutes later someone is pounding on the door, I'm freaking out, the oldest kid goes and answers it, the landlord Ray, is standing there in his underwear angry as can be. 
he swears that Dustin was looking in his bedroom window, he knows it was him because the person had long hair, he goes on to say he was holding a flashlight to illuminate himself so he could try and scare Ray and his wife by moaning and crying. Ryan, oldest kid, said he'd deal with it. Closed door said WTF did you guys do? I tried to explain, he just said ditch witch, La Llorona was after you. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. Never walk that bridge again. When I moved into an apartment after a breakup I lived next to this older Indian guy who was really protective. Like he'd always check on me. I thought he was kind of daddish so maybe he thought of me like his daughter, I was barely 21. He'd do things like watch while I'd take my trash out at night to make sure I was okay. I think now looking back it's because he knew that apartment was haunted. It started small, little things missing. Then one day, while in my living room, my dishwasher turned itself on. The next day, I heard a crash in the kitchen and went in to find various things a cookbook, measuring cups, a colander, a dish towel all flung into the same corner of the kitchen. I'd regularly go in to find the lid of my garbage can upside down. I started waking up with long scratches down my chest. Almost like cuts. I don't have long nails and this was before I had a cat. But they were long slices. Then, I started finding shards of broken glass outside my bedroom door. I lived alone, there were never any broken bottles or anything. The thing that was the breaking point was me straightening my hair and my webcam in the living room because the outlet in my bathroom didn't work. I leaned in close to get my bangs and I swear that this sounds fake but is so real there was a skeletal slash dead face behind me in the camera. I threw the laptop so fast and had a total breakdown. I did not renew my lease. I just want to say, my house is fairly new and was built in the late 90s. There is absolutely no reason for it to be haunted, no deaths or past horrible events have happened on or near the property. Even so, my parents, siblings, and I have all experienced both eerie and unexplainable things living here. I was sleeping on a couch in my downstairs living room, it was Christmas and I had family over meaning my parents would evict me from my bedroom and let one of my aunts slash uncles use it. It was around 9pm, I was trying to make myself go to sleep because I just wanted the day to be over with. Nothing was working, at that point I was just lying there staring at the back rest of the couch as my Christmas tree played holiday songs. It didn't help that I slept right next to the stupid tree. Lying there, I began to hear something in the music playing from the tree. It sounded like very soft whispers, it was so quiet that I ignored it and assumed it to be the music box that was playing the instrumental Christmas songs as its age caught up with it. The whispers got louder, it became recognizable and eventually became louder than the music playing. It was more distinct, it wasn't coming from the tree, it was coming from right next to my head. It sounded like multiple people whispering, having conversations, the whispers would be relatively quiet and suddenly get louder as they would emphasize a word slash sentence. I couldn't understand a single word they said. I didn't know how to react, I wasn't scared and was more confused than anything. I thought my brain was playing jokes on me, it had to have been that, I finally pulled myself together and turned around and faced the tree. I said out loud what the hell is that sound? Causing all the whispering to come to a halt, it was completely quiet except for the tree playing Oh Little Town of Bethlehem. I stared at the tree for a little bit and lied back down on the couch chalking it up to be my imagination or something. That's when, in a clear voice right next to my ear, I heard someone whisper he can hear us. Immediately following what I heard, dozens of whispering voices louder than before began wailing. This time I could understand what they were all saying. They were begging for help, I don't know why but every single voice was begging for help. I was frozen, I've never been more scared in my entire life. It took all the courage I had to finally get up and run to my parents' room where they were watching a movie. I explained what happened and they didn't really know how to react nor did they really believe me. After a while of getting myself back together, I returned to the couch like nothing happened and once again lied there. I didn't hear anything else that night and neither did I sleep. I was traveling in Peru with three other friends. I had heard about vortexes but didn't really understand or believe in this sort of energy until I had these things happen. Our first afternoon we went to Moray, site of Inca crop circles, each level with its own microclimate. Our driver dropped us off and said, go to the bottom, some people have felt energy there. I shrugged it off but when we were at the bottom level of the site, I jokingly said to my friends, let's hold hands and see if we feel anything. A few seconds later, I felt electro stim coming from my right foot going up my leg. My friend who was facing me felt it in her left leg. Another afternoon, we went to Olentitambo, an Inca site on the mountain. Our guide took us to the Inca baths. It was a smooth granite rock that was squared off with water flowing on top of the rock, then down the side. He stepped in and ran his finger across the rock and the water stopped flowing. Then ran it across again and the water resumed flowing. 
I had no words. I've only seen one reference to this on Google searches. At Machu Picchu we walked up to the sun dial. I noticed people holding their hands close to the rock but not touching. They were trying to feel energy. I thought, what the heck, I'll try too. A few seconds later I felt that same electro stim on my right hand going from my middle finger up my right arm. To this day I don't know what to believe. Vortexes exist but you never know when you'll experience it. I did a meditation hike in Utah on what was considered a vortex and started to have an out-of-body experience. I freaked out and woke myself up before anything happened. It never happened again in this spot nor on any of my travels. While staying at a small house for a week or so, while looking for an apartment. My family and I became convinced it was haunted. We saw green lightning coming down on top of a nearby hill one night, in an area with a pretty large population, yet no one we've asked had seen it and no weather reports we could find were made about such a weird weather pattern for the area. One of the last nights we were there became a pretty solid example of why I believe in ghosts. There was a small door built into the living room wall, next to the fireplace, that led to nothing. Just a small door about a foot and half tall, one foot wide, and just over a foot deep into the wall. We always got a weird feeling about it, and noticed when it was open, you could only see a few inches inside. Almost like the shadows inside made it seem like it went on much further than it did. I can remember a single time I opened it to see if I could figure out the point of it. I slept in the living room with two of my siblings and one of those nights I had a nightmare about being chased, caught, and dragged. Details about the dream are fuzzy but I remember feeling hands on my ankles, pulling me back vividly. I woke up from the nightmare at least five feet away from where I fell asleep, with that door open, and both my legs inside, to the point where my toes would touch the inside wall if I barely stretched them. None of my siblings could have managed to move me into that small of a space and into that position without waking me. I was about 5 apostrophe 5 at the time and not very light. I hardly ever think about that place or that little door anymore but when it comes to mind it's my textbook example of a haunted house. In New Jersey there is the infamous Clinton Road. There are many legends of supernatural things there and many teens in NJ end up going there. There's also good hiking spots. In 2011, I was hiking there with two friends, it was later in the evening and we were returning to my car when I saw a monkey in a tree. There should be no monkeys in New Jersey let alone the United States I think? There was no doubt that it was a monkey and not anything else, I got up to it very close, very confused. At first maybe I thought it was a sloth, perhaps sloths could be in New Jersey I thought to myself? My friends saw it too, but we were all young and they didn't think it was that unusual, apparently not knowing that a monkey shouldn't be anywhere near New Jersey. I took a photo, but unfortunately I had a very bad phone at the time, before everyone having smartphones, and so you barely see anything but can make out a blurry outline of a small primate. Only recently I did some research and found there have been others seeing monkeys in the woods of Clinton Road. As far as I know I have the only photo of a wild monkey in NJ but it's too blurry to even see anything. My only guess is either, this is an elaborate prank played for years by a pet monkey owner. Or there is claims there are escaped monkeys from an abandoned zoo in the 70s but very few people even believe the stories. I for one know what I saw. Winter in rural Ontario, watching a movie with my uncle and cousin. Went out to get some firewood, it felt odd as soon I stepped outside. We hadn't started the snow machines yet that year and it was snowing that night, I grabbed a couple pieces of wood and right on the third piece I heard a low voice say hello about 10 feet away in the untouched yard. I dropped the wood and ran back inside. My cousin and uncle are 6 feet 5 inches and 6 feet 6 inches, they heard me rush in and asked what happened, I told them and they went out and looked around. Sure enough there were no tracks anywhere. After the movie ended I went to bed, I was almost asleep when I felt the ground shift outside my window. Then I heard a bang on the wall outside, as if someone grabbed a big piece of wood and used it as a battering ram against the wall. I was so scared that something was going to bust through the window I literally froze and had to tell myself to move and go upstairs. I told my cousins what happened and they went back and looked around again. No tracks again. Even today that night bothers me, that was like 20 years ago. My cousin and I were on a late night drive in the mountains. We were on a small dirt and stone road, just coming out of a sharp curve, when we see this weird creature, broadside and looking at us. It had fur like a deer, was brown, with a white deer-like face and underside of neck. Its stance a little bigger than a trophy whitetail buck, a little longer than one as well, with a big humped back. I was confused BC my brain was trying to register it as a deer, but also knew it didn't look like one. A split second later, it just looks like a normal deer, average sized deer. But it hasn't moved positions, other than its head was turned away. No deer had moved from behind it or in front of it. It literally just transformed. 
I stayed quiet for a second, then my cousin says that deer scared me for a second. And I was like oh my god you saw IT too? And she described exactly what I had seen, and said it turned into a normal deer as well. We chalked it up to a flesh crawler, if you know what I mean. But yeah. Ducking wild. In the 1950s, my grandmother passed away in her sleep from cancer, in our family farmhouse. My father was just a child at the time. Being rural people with limited medical knowledge, they burned her mattress in case it was something contagious. My father barely knew her, and rarely ever talked about it. My entire life, people joked with me because where my family farm is located is one street over from the town's local legend haunted place. This isn't about that, I've never experienced anything out of the ordinary from that place. In the early 2000s, my high school friends wanted to explore that reportedly haunted place late at night. I took them, it was boring, I offered to show them around my creepy family farm instead. One guy had a panic attack in the attic. One girl hyperventilated in the master bedroom. All in all, I figured it was them overreacting. I'm quite skeptical and have never experienced anything at that house that didn't have a plausible explanation. When exploring the basement, I and two other people heard piano music coming from the main floor. There was no piano on the main floor. There was no radio up there, the TV took forever to turn on, there wasn't a solid reason for three people to hear that. I figured someone in the group played music off their phone to freak us out. We then left, thinking little to nothing of it. A few years ago, I was joking with my father. I was old enough to tell him stories of the stupid shit my friends and I did behind our parents' back, now that we could laugh about it and not be punished. My entire life, my father always referred to family members by their relation to me. His father was always your grandpa, his sister was always your aunt. I told him about the night we explored the family farmhouse, and the piano music. He stopped what he was doing and had a thousand yard stare. My mom loved to play piano, he said. A friend and I decided to go to a diner for a late night meal. We were both home and one of us texted the other to see if they wanted to come eat. I ended up driving and I picked up my friend and we went to a diner in Fort Lee, New Jersey. We went to this particular diner cause my friend was friends with someone who used to work there. Anyways we both were disappointed in our food. It was poorly made by NJ diner standards. Neither of us finished our meal and decided to head home. While driving I got distracted by our conversation on how bad the food was and made the right turn too early. I turned into Route 4 and wanted Route 46 instead. Since we were in no rush neither of us thought it was a big deal. I saw an exit to Grand Avenue which is where we wanted to go to from Route 46 so I took it. It didn't take us where we were expecting. I thought maybe if we kept driving we would eventually pass through a part of Grand Avenue we recognized. We quickly realized we were in odd place. I say this because we were driving in the woods. This part of NJ is right outside of NYC and is very developed. As we are driving we see an abandoned car to the left of us. The car didn't look old or beat up. We were questioning why someone would leave their car there then suddenly we see a police car up ahead. I figured we would go up to the officer and ask for directions or at least find out where we were. As we approach the police car we notice all its lights are on and the driver's side door was open. We saw no one around us and started seriously wondering WTF is going on. The road up ahead curves and the trees block our view of the what's ahead. I see red light coming through the trees and figure we are close to civilization again. We finish with the curve and I realize that the red light is coming from the moon. This was no ordinary moon. It covered the entire sky. It was so close you can see all the craters easily. They were filled with what appeared to be blood. Some of them appeared to be overflowing with blood leading to rivers of blood. The best way I can describe this is to imagine a volcano spewing blood. I am watching all this while driving in silence. I say to myself that my food must have been drugged or that I'm having a mental breakdown. I tell myself I'm not going to mention what I'm seeing, drop my friend home, and then drive myself to the hospital. As I'm observing the bloody moon that appears so close that it will crash into the earth I'm pondering what is wrong with me. After several minutes of silence my friend says to me we're going to die. I ask him why he would say that and he looks at me and says don't you see the moon? It's covered in blood and it's going to crash and kill us all. Believe it or not when he said this I felt a huge sense of relief because at least I'm not hallucinating. We both can't see the same hallucination at the same time. I tell him the truth about why I stayed silent when I saw it. I describe what I see and he points out various parts in the moon and we both quickly come to the conclusion that we are looking at the same thing. Oddly enough we are calm. I explain that I don't believe that we are looking at the moon cause if it was truly as close as it appeared we would experience its gravitational effects. We both agree that death is at hand. Some time passes and the road has another steep curve. The trees block out the sky and the red light from the moon continues to shine from them. 
After driving though the curve the woods abruptly end. I stop the car and we both look behind us. The bloody moon is gone. I tell my friend this doesn't make sense and we need to go back into the woods. He refuses and demands to be dropped off at his home. I drop him off and duplicate the drive I made earlier to get back to the moon. I couldn't even find the woods again. The exit to Grand Avenue didn't lead to the same place as before. For the next several days I drive around and go through Yahoo Maps and MapQuest to try to find the woods but could not find anything close enough to be a candidate. We both talk about it to this day and try to find some meaning in it. My friend was more open to people about what he saw than me and people tended to think he was crazy or super religious. I stayed relatively silent since I know no one would believe me. Two summers ago I was camping in Oregon with friends and went up a hill to take a poop. I looked around carefully, then dropped trousers and started doing my thing. Suddenly from a bush 30 feet away, an adult black bear growled angrily and rushed out, running away. I did an honest check, but my guess is the bear froze to see what I was doing. Dark fur or hair can be incredibly difficult to spot even in bright daylight amongst foliage it kind of hacks your brain. Are you familiar with cameras? You know how you have to sort of choose what to expose to most of the time, you either get one part of the frame well lit or another, but usually not all of it. The amount of light a camera can expose to and maintain good detail without over or under exposing an image is called dynamic range. Anything outside of that is going to look terrible as it's over or underexposed. The eye is like that, only its dynamic range is way better than even the most cutting edge camera. But there's still limits, and dark fur on a sunny day can be hard to spot if it's behind some cover. Your eye is naturally exposing to what's overwhelming it the most, which is the bright sunlight. This makes anything in shadows much darker and harder to see. Plus, the eyes have the brain to kind of sabotage them, because your brain is looking for patterns it can recognize. This is why zebra and tiger stripes work so good at their respective jobs, they sort of confuse the brain which is looking for a known, general shape. It's also why military camo is so good at its job. These creatures are absolute masters of stealth, and you'd sort of have to be if you're that big but still need to be able to get close enough to prey like deer to take them down. But they're also very fast because they're so big, which lets them cover a ton of ground very quickly. The thing is though, they are obviously intelligent. If you listen to enough reports you'll realize that they know about the difficulty in spotting dark colors amidst shadows in bright daylight, and they know the eye tracks movement so they stay stock still behind some cover. What I've never figured out is how in the hell they move so damn quietly when they want to even in brush. I had one we captured on night vision right outside our camp and despite the area being littered with dead branches and sticks, when it turned around to leave, after realizing we could see it because we were staring at its location, it made no noise. There was an experiment done by a research group a few years ago where they invited a group of people to go hike a trail. They told the group that they had put a man in a Bigfoot costume on a 1.5 mile stretch of that trail. The only photo they captured of the man in the costume was totally by accident, and he wasn't even hiding. He was just standing watching them next to a waterfall that someone had taken a photo of because it was pretty. One time I was camping with an ex. We had taken a bunch of LSD and we were listening to music and just enjoying the trip in the tent when I started to see flashes of light. At first I figured it was just some other campers shining a flashlight around but it kept happening. Then we finally heard a distant ominous boom. I look outside, one side of the sky is a clear starry night, the other side was giant black doom cloud with an absolutely enormous amount of lightning coming out of it. We scrambled to get everything out of the tent and into the car. I remember picking up armloads of stuff that was just melting into my arms cause I was so high. We left the lent cause we couldn't figure out how to take it down, and huddled in the car. By this time the storm was just about to be on top of us. It was by far the craziest electrical storm I've ever seen, and not just because I was tripping, it was at least a strike every second, sometimes more, and it went on for about 8 hours. At one point I looked over at my ex, and her hair was standing right up on end, and she looked at me and the widening of eyes told me mine was too. We had maybe a half second of realization, and then boom. It was like someone threw a flashbang grenade beside me. I looked to my right out the passenger window, and there was this streak of ionized air where the strike had landed, I literally could have opened the window and grabbed it. I grew up in a very small, very rural town in the southwest corner of California's Central Valley. I know when many people think of anywhere in California, they think freeways, beaches and people. In my case, there were areas I could drive to and be 30 miles from the nearest person. When I was 17 years old, my best friend and I decided we'd take his pickup truck southwest out of town, over the Tembler mountain range, and into the vast Caruso Plains, a prehistoric dry lake that ran 35 miles east-west and 10 miles north-south. We stopped for a moment at the crest, about 4,000, and surveyed the giant valley below us. 
It was a clear late night, around midnight, and far down below, we both saw a small orange flicker. Maybe two to three miles as the crow flies from our vantage point. It took 15 minutes to get there in 4WD, down the backside of the mountain. When we arrived, we found that it was the burning embers of a fire. No fire pit, no tire tracks, no people. I took out a large spotlight, plugged it into the cigarette lighter plug, opened the passenger window and illuminated the immediate area in a 360 degrees pattern. Nothing. Nobody. Not a bush, not a tree, nothing but flat, even dry lake bed. I brought the light back into the cab, and we positioned the truck to spin the rear tires to choke out the fire, my buddy was a literal boy scout. When my head came back to a level position, I saw him. Let me take a step back here for a second and explain something about southwest Kern County in the mid-90s. It was white. In my community of 25,000, we had one black family that lived in town. One. Less than 50 years before that time, it was common knowledge not to let the sun set on your black ass in Taft. There was actually a sign on the road into town. A long history of racism, violence, and overall bigotry to this day hangs over the area. Back to the lake bed. I saw him. The largest human man I had ever seen. Black, between 6'4 and 6'7, muscular, naked except for a pair of undersized denim shorts that I remember looking ripped. He was staring directly at me, not an arm's length from me outside the passenger window. He was almost smiling at me, but it was a wide-eyed, dangerous smile. I looked at my friend and started to yell go go go, and from the look on his face, I was certain he saw the same thing I did. The truck took off in a giant cloud of dust. I shouted did you see that? And his response was something like WTF, you scared the shit out of me, what's wrong? I sunk. I knew what I saw, I wasn't crazy, and I wasn't high or drunk. I explained exactly what I saw, in great detail. I was pretty sure he believed me. Here's the kicker, there are at least 50 different ways to get into town from where we were. Several dirt roads, mountain roads, long ways around from either side, etc. My buddy drove fast back to town, and we came in a completely different way than we left. In all, it took nearly 40 minutes to see the lights of town. Still driving fast, we came around a turn on the semi-paved road down the foothills into the south side of town, and it happened. The same man stepped out from behind a row of tumbleweeds along the side of the road onto the shoulder. Still nearly unclothed, staring at us both. As we passed, both of our necks jerking backward to continue looking at the man as he very purposefully, staring us in the eyes, wagged his index finger at us in that Dennis Nedry ah, ah, ah style. Please tell me you saw that. I remember saying to my buddy. I could tell by his eyes that he did, and he nodded, asking if that was the same guy. No dude, that's a totally different giant half-naked black guy. To this day, this is the only real unexplainable thing that has ever happened to me. There was no way he could have known which way we would have gone back into town, and even if it was a good guess, there was absolutely no way he could have beaten us there. When I was 18 I was doing some youth work abroad in Germany with a Christian organization hosting an inter-school sports tournament. I'm not religious personally but knew the people running it and wanted to do some volunteer work with them at the time. On the drive to the airport I get a call from my family who had come together in my absence after hearing the news that my grandfather had passed away. I was asked if I wanted to turn back or continue despite me already being many hours from home. My family urged me to continue stating he would never want anyone missing on a new story to tell friends and family, so I went all the same despite desperately wanting to go home. I was a mess. He was the only true male role model I had in my life. Halfway through the trip I'm sat alone in a corner of a dining hall watching a buddy of mine play guitar and sing to the kids attending the tournament. More kids arrive and sing along while I continue to sit on my own, all the while I get this ever-growing sensation that I'm being watched or someone else is there with me. I keep looking around the room to see nothing out of the ordinary, until eventually I look over my shoulder onto the next table over, maybe 15 feet away, I see, clear as day, my granddad. He sat watching everyone singing, joyously smiling away with not a care in the world, with three other figures sat around him. The other figures were almost a bright emanating light, no discernible features. So I did what any normal non-God-fearing person would do in that situation. I ran. I left that hall as fast as I could and bolted to the furthest point of the compound I could find, enough that it was away from all the swathes of people, out of sight and dimly lit, I dived onto the nearest bench and bawled my eyes out. I put my head in my hands and cried, and the second I closed my eyes it was as if I could see him standing right next to me, just his legs, and felt what I could only describe as a pressure on my shoulder. A reassuring hand. It comforted me almost immediately and I stopped crying. I sat there, head in hands, 
staring at his legs through closed eyes for what felt like forever. I didn't want him to go and I feel that was the last time I saw him. I'm not spiritual. I'm not religious. I don't even tend to typically believe in spooky ghost stories and the like, but I know what I saw. I miss that man. I'm a medic and firefighter. We once had a call for something normal, like chest pain or something, I can't remember. The caller said he was in his barn slash garage, which isn't weird really around here. Anyway we pull up on scene and something just felt off. No idea why but something just told me in my gut that something was wrong. I decided to do a 360 around the building before we went through the door at the front that was clearly the entrance. I walk around and come to a window on the side of the building and look in. There was a shotgun rigged to the door. The guy had set a booby trap for us. And he had hung himself as well. We kicked in this plexiglass type material on the side of the building and entered that way. Guy was dead. Nothing we could do about it at that point. I would have been the first through that door. No idea why I didn't just walk through it that day.